Please be careful of compression and limiters. I'm being sent a lot of good demos that are ruined by being over compressed and limited. I used to do it to all my own music. I used to compress every instrument, every track to try and make it louder because I was caught up in the loudness war. Now I treat compression as an effect. If I want something to sound compressed or to glue some elements together, I will tuck a compressor underneath by a bus and I will maintain the original dynamics of the original signal and I will also have that compressed sound. Another way that I will use compression is as a correction tool. So I've, if I've recorded a vocal and it's inconsistent, I'll compress it slightly. Or if I've recorded an, an instrument that's a little bit inconsistent. Other than that, I don't really um, use compression. If you don't understand it, please use it sparingly because it will and does ruin your music. There are some people like the likes of Noisia that can use it very well. Um, but please understand compression. Peace. Easy Tribe, Happy New Year. I'm going to be doing these 60 second music production and industry tips, one a day for 2017. So the first one is, please try and find inspiration from anywhere but the genre you're actually um, aspiring to be in. Everything's a remix. Genres are built from amalgamations of other genres all of the artists that you love, you love them because they're unique, they've got their own twist on things. And what kills genres is everybody trying to be like their favourite artist. Which is fine, but listen to other genres. Listen to music that you may not usually listen to and take something from all these different places, a variety of different places, and put them into your own pot and create your signature sound. Peace. A track is never actually finished, it's only abandoned. There needs to come a time where you put a lid on the track and move on. The most exciting part is laying down the idea, the boiling pot. That takes about an hour, two hours. The rest is mixing and arranging and technical edits and stuff. Don't get too caught up in trying to make the banger. One in ten tracks might be the banger. One in ten tracks might be the release. But it's like going to the gym. You need to go through the workout, jam out your idea, mix it, arrange it, put the track away, move on to the next track. Um, then you can revisit these tracks at a later date when you've learned new techniques. If you get caught up on one track for too long, it's just going to drive you insane. You need to go through the motions. You need to complete the workout. You need to learn new things. You won't learn if you're continually working on one track. So forget the bangers, move on and enjoy the process. Peace. I call this one the boiling pot. Now when you're working on a track, try working down before you work across. Don't just sequence a couple of key elements and then start to arrange the song. You'll have to stop and then go back and create new ideas and look for new sounds. Think of a chef. A chef doesn't go to the fridge for one ingredient at a time. He will collect his ingredients, then he will start to cook the meal, create the masterpiece. I recommend working down in a four or an eight bar section. Keep working down. As you go along you can mix, you can EQ, you can parallel compress, you can make sure things are consistent with regards to the levels, you can make sure it's working musically, and then when you have enough elements, it doesn't matter if you have too many, you can then start to cook the meal, create the masterpiece, and it will, the arrangement will come naturally, and you won't have to go back and look for new elements. This is a, a really good tip that I give my students that find it very, very beneficial, so try it out. Peace. Are you really supporting the scene that you want to be in? Are you buying the records or are you downloading them for free? Are you going to the local events and supporting all the promoters or are you not going unless you get on the guest list? Many of your idols are probably struggling more than you think. What looks good on paper is not necessarily the case. It's really important. The, the exact scene that you want to enter needs support. It needs people going to the clubs. It needs people buying the music. I know my generation coming through um, the jungle days, we had to save our dinner money to buy vinyl. We went to all the clubs. We were out on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday. Every night of the week there was something going on and we would travel up and down the country to support it. 
The bass music scene really needs your support and it will only make it better for you once you do make it into the industry. So please support where you can. Peace. Today I'd like to talk about the use of samples. I had a big shock a couple of years ago when my sequencing class started and a lot of learners come, came in with um, a load of tracks they'd made but purely made of loops and samples from sample packs. Now there is an art form to this, however you would benefit greatly from learning about all the processes and how these sounds and are made for yourself. It gives you more control over the mix. A lot of these sounds and samples are over-processed. They're hyped up to attract you. Um, Over-compressed, too much reverbs, too much delays. And it really will have a negative impact and give you little control over your mix downs. Um, so practice learning about the effects, sequencing in MIDI, and learning in general about music technology. And this will really benefit you with your productions. Peace. Easy Tribe, um, the car is stationary by the way, do not use your phone when driving. Um, this one is about sub bass, if you're making music for the club, if you're making bass music, I strongly recommend having an independent sub of any of your growling synth type sounds. So a way to do this is layer a sine wave. Um, doing the same thing as your lead sound and tuck it underneath. If the sine wave sounds too different to the lead sound, you can copy the lead sound down, um, take out all the highs and mids and just expose the, expose the low frequencies. This way you have independent control over a sub layer and therefore you can have a, a heavier, bassier mix down. Um, try it out. Peace. Always follow your dreams, but always have a backup plan. I've been around this industry for 20 years. I gave up careers for music and I've been around the world two or three times doing what I love doing. However, now I'm a fully qualified teacher with a master's degree in advanced music technology. I left school with no qualifications and I thought that DJing was going to be me for the rest of my life. Um, it's not always the case. You will have your moment. I've, I know many DJs that were, have been DJing four or five times a week, they've been flavour of the month and then things slow down. Now they fell into DJing and producing and they don't have anything to back it up, no other career. Um, so please focus on education, focus on a job, on a trade. We're not all overly academic. I was far from academic but my passion for music gave me a master's degree. So. Please focus, work hard, and always have a backup plan, but always follow your dreams. Take care. Peace. Please be cautious of overdoing your reverb and delays. Reverb sounds very attractive, it's pleasing to the ear, but you need to remember, especially if you're making music for the club, that the room that the music is going to be played in is a natural reverb in itself. So if your track is too wet with reverb, it's going to have the added room reverb on top of it and tracks often sound quite thin. When I first started making tracks, I used to love the sound of reverb and I'd have reverb on everything. And then I'd play them in the club and exactly that, they would sound really thin and I couldn't work it out. So what I do now is I pull back the reverb and if anything, I'll put it on a bus. Uh, so I'll maintain those original dynamics, but I'll put the reverbs and the delays underneath so you kind of get the best of both worlds. It's a bit different to the dry and wet on, on a plugin because you're still running it through the plugin. So try bussing your effects and don't get too excited with reverb and delay. Peace. We all want people to like our music, but please don't be disheartened if you send your music off and somebody doesn't like it. Everybody has their own opinion. Now, for a long time I beat myself up. I've had some great mentors over the years and I've been very lucky but I limited myself to other people's feedback and this really held me back in a sense. Um, as much as I respected the mentors that I had, the day that I said to myself, you know, I like my music, I know it's of a, of a decent quality because I'm comparing it against what is out there and what I love, so therefore I'm going to plough forward as I am and please myself rather than trying to please everybody else then my whole world changed that's when I started to get signed um, even when you think somebody is going to like something they may not but don't be disheartened everybody has their own opinion and stick to your guns be patient
piece. An arrangement really can make or break a track. You can have the most simplest elements and then with the right arrangement the whole thing can just come alive. Now I get asked a lot of questions about arrangements. I highly recommend that you analyse some of your favourite tracks within a variety of genres. You'll soon find that there's only a handful of different types of genres that are commonly used. You can then use these templates on your music and put your twist on them. Don't think too complicated. Often when you feel the need to add something to an arrangement, chances are if you take out some hi-hats or you take out a small element it can give us the um, impression that something bigger has happened. So often when arranging, less can be more. But I definitely strongly recommend analysing genres, making a note of how long the intro is, how long the first drop is, and then using those templates. It's something that I struggled with too. Peace. This is a technique that I use in pretty much every single track. So you have your kick drum and your sub bass and often to get that relationship working correctly is hard work. We can side chain, we can EQ correctly but still often we, we have a battle between the kick and the sub. Now our ears are in tune to 3 to 4k more naturally over other frequencies. This is based on the Fletcher Munson curve. So I recommend taking an 808 hi-hat um, gating it or using an enveloper to make it very 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 tight and you're not using it as a hi-hat you're going to tuck it underneath very 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 faintly underneath your kick drum almost creating a click or a transient this when battling against the um, the sub will poke through number one our ears are more in tunes two it's a different frequency so try it out let me know how it gets on and please share these videos if you're feeling them peace I'm often asked how to overcome writer's block. Now this is not easy, but the best thing I ever did was force myself out of the genre that I engaged with for 10 to 15 years, drum and bass, as Outrage. And I forced myself into writing a multi-genre album. So I had to research and engage with 15 to 20 different genres. And what I learned from this was so valuable. Each genre had different cultures, different ways of doing things, different production techniques, different mix down techniques. And then I could then bring that into what I do. Um, and actually I found a love for new genres that I didn't actually appreciate before. So now I wake up any given day and I will turn the machine on and I can set it to 120, 170, 140 and actually it gives me so much more freedom and scope that writer's block is very very minimal. So don't limit yourself and have fun. Peace. Next time you mix down one of your tracks try keeping every single element in mono. You can pan mono signals. It's one thing that um, I t it took a while for me to get my head around before. So keep everything in mono. You kick in your sub and anything kind of um, below around about two to three hundred hertz it should always be a mono anyway that's subjective and then try placing some stereo effects underneath your mono signal um, and not just one but two or three different layers so you have one bus that has a, a certain kind of reverb pan slide to the left and another one with a different re reverb pan to the right then you can also offset some of the percussive elements so if you've got triplets you can have one slightly to the left one slightly to the right and one in the middle try this technique you'll find that your mixes are more upfront in the mix and closer um, and always fold your mixes down to mono every now and then to make sure they sound fat let me know how you get on and please share these videos for me EQ is one of the most important processes when making a track my world literally changed when I started to learn about the theory of sound so understanding that each instrument relies on its fundamental frequencies and overtones and ensuring you had no frequency clashes in the mix making sure I covered the frequency spectrum while respecting each instrument's um, fundamentals now also I've been engaging in recent years in subtractive EQing so instead of adding I reduce if I want more tops I'll take out lows and mids if I want more lows I'll take out highs and mids and etc so for me I find this saves on headroom rather than pushing the frequencies and risking clipping and going into the red I subtract EQ I find it sounds a lot cleaner but check it out let me know what you think um, so learn a bit about the theory of sound and practice subtractive EQ. 
If you find these tips helpful, please share. Peace. It's most people's dream to get signed to a record label and it's increasingly more difficult, especially now music's so more accessible. I strongly recommend being proactive, support your local scene, be seen because too many people are just sitting behind their computer screen sending off demos. Wait and be patient, make sure your music's ready because if you do get somebody to listen, which is one, which is one of the hardest things, you want them to be impressed the first time round. So be patient be consistent, keep chopping and the tree will fall. I always say to my students, unfortunately, I think the music scene is probably 30% talent and 70% hustle. And I don't mean hustle in a slimy way. I mean hard work, determination, consistency, being unique and being proactive. Do more than just sit behind a computer screen. Stay confident, enjoy it, and have fun is the most important. Tree making music like going to the gym. You've got to be consistent, you've got to be motivated, and even if you don't feel like going into the studio, um, just try and go in there and maybe do a bit of sound design, a bit of sampling, or learn a new technique. Um, consistency is key, and it's very hard to stay motivated, but what's most important is that you enjoy the ride and try and learn as you go along, okay? If I do multiple reps with a light weight, there's gonna be progression. So often, you don't always have to bust your balls to get a result. This is not meant to be a mockery. This is just some motivation to say, if you're consistent, you can develop and progress. So keep up the hard work, peace. If you have a mix down that sounds quite congested, quite nasally, and you can't hear all of the elements, chances are you've got a problem in where I call the mud range area. For me, a common area is 700 to a K. If I do a scoop on a master EQ, it generally alleviates uh, the elements and allows the track to breathe. However, the ideal situation would be to correct this along the way by making sure you haven't got too many instruments fighting for the space in the mix. Another common area to look out for is the two to 300 hertz area. A lot of instruments rely on this space in the frequency spectrum um, due to their fundamental frequencies. So, um, it's a quick fix, but try it out on your master fader and you should find your tracks breathe a lot more and sound a lot more cleaner. If you're feeling these videos and you're benefiting from them, please do share them because for me it's about as many people learning as possible and it gets me motivated as well. Always A, B your music against something that sounds good. Um, you're not listening for the volume because we don't want to get caught up in the loudness war. But if there's something you know that sounds good in a variety of different environments, in the car, in the club, turn it down to the same audible volume as the track you're working on. And what you're listening for is the dynamic, um, anything with regards to the stereo field, the, um, the frequency spectrum, um, and obviously it's going to sound a bit more compressed and stuff, so you don't want to take too much notice of that. But you're just listening for the dynamics and you want to try and use it as a guideline. And then aim for like a minus 10 pre-master and then whack it through something like ozone. If you don't already, try tuning your drums into the key, the scale that you're working in. For example, I often work in F minor and some relative majors and minors around that based on the circuit fits. But often I'll have my kick drum tuned into the root note. So if I'm an F minor, my kick's going to be an F. And often that's the first note of my bass line as well. So, and then you've got other percussive elements. I use a lot of African drums and hand drums and drums that can, can be tuned. They've actually got a tone to them and I'll often tune them into one of the notes within that scale. Rides can be tuned, I'll even tune a hi-hat if, if I can. Now, if you're struggling to do this by ear, use, uh, for example, in Logic, there's pitch correction. It will show you where each of the hits are hitting, and you can then tune them. I just think it helps the mix consolidate, and everything works musically. Try it out, let me know what you think. Peace. 
One of the hardest things when writing music is being able to transfer the ideas from your head and your influences down onto the DAW. And I don't think it matter what door you use as long as you can translate those ideas. In order to be able to do that, I think it's important to understand the fundamentals, the rules, and then we break the rules once you have an understanding. So learn a little bit about music theory. Um, the theory of sound is very important. Um, the spatial awareness, the stereo field. Learn about all the different types of effects we have, compression, reverbs, delays. Learn the rules, learn your tools and this will help you be able to translate those ideas onto the software. Um, being able to analyze music, hearing music, and then straight away identifying what processes have been used to make that track happen in addition to your ideas. Have fun, enjoy the process, and please share these videos if you're... I'm always banging on to my students about a signature sound. What are you bringing fresh to this genre? And I'm often asked, well, what can I do that's not been done already? To a certain extent, that's true within the genre you're in. Don't forget, everything's a remix, taking a multitude of ideas and influences from a variety of places will contribute towards your signature sound. Um, think outside the box. Now, it doesn't have to be a distinct stylistic feature, it can be a set of processes. So the way that you do your reverb, the way you process your snares, um, these small things that over time people will be able to familiarise with what you do. Um, you know, back in the jungle days, you knew a Dillinger track, you knew a Fotec track, within the first two bars, just the way that they did things. A signature sound is essential for longevity, um, and if you can do this in a variety of tempo tempos, that's even more powerful, but not easy to achieve. Think outside the box and be consistent, and let me know how you get on. Peace. I've talked about how reverb can make your track sound thin and washed out if you use too much of it. I'd like to now talk about how beneficial reverb can be. Reverb is emulating a space uh, or an environment. So for me, what I aim for when I'm, I'm mixing down my music is for each element to have its own space in the mix, its own characteristics, its own entity, but at the same time, it's a part of the same track. You may have um, seen tips about having one reverb on a bus and then having all of your channels that you want to apply reverb going through that same bus for consistency. I prefer the opposite. I prefer each sound to have its own tiny tight reverb to help separate it from the mix but then I'll give it some glue maybe with some parallel compression or some clever EQing or other other processes. So it's really important for me to have every element in the mix having its own space. Um, give it a go, let me know what you think, and look out for the International Online School coming soon. Coming from a non-academic background, I was very fortunate enough to get onto a master's degree in advanced music technology from my industry experience. I was far from academic and I, I struggled with traditional learning. Now, reading for me is difficult due to my chronic anxiety, concentration is very difficult, but I had to find out my style of learning, and that's visual, it's practical. Now, I achieved what I thought was totally out of my reach by applying myself and finding out the way that I learn best. Now, the main point of this tip is we can all learn. There are many different ways we can learn, and I strongly recommend um, engaging with learning new things, setting yourself challenges, and don't think that you cannot learn because you may not learn in a traditional way. In the next few months, I'm going to be opening up an international online school, and if you're interested, please email insidenomine at gmail.com for info. Peace. This one relates back onto past tips where I've been promoting a unique sound, a signature sound. Now, I pride myself in sound design. I like to build things from scratch. I like to go and record sounds of the street and process it via granular synthesis to make a pad or some textures. You know, I'll take a wooden spoon and hit it on a saucepan and make it into percussion. These sorts of things, these processes, are what will contribute towards a signature sound if you're consistent. Sound design, for me, is, is a fundamental part. You will do things in your own way. Remember we talked about having your own individual processes, that if you're consistent with it, you'll then develop a signature sound. Look at the likes of Burial. The way he does things, you just know it's Burial, regardless of what tempo it is. So, re again, Know, know the rules and know your tools and experiment with sound design. Let me know how you get on and please share if you're digging. Peace. 
When you're attempting to enter a new genre that you've never made before, it's not just a case of just putting the BPM on, say for example, 170 if it's a jungle or drum and bass track. There's a lot more to it than that. It's a case of um, what I think will benefit is if you trace the genre back to its originality, um, where it came from, and then the different evolutionary steps that it's made. Because most genres, they, um, they have a couple of different generations, two or three generations of their sound, and they evolve with technology. So it's always good to have an understanding and appreciation of the genre from its beginnings to then be able to have the tools to go and have an attempt to make a convincing track within that genre. Obviously you need listening skills and you can listen to tracks with, with modern day tracks within a certain genre and be able to um, recreate something but definitely tracing it back can help. Enjoy. Peace.